Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hi, and welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, filmmaking freedom for the independent. Today's episode is sponsored by the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion While Doing It. It's available in paperback, as in Kindle ebook, as well as an audiobook. In fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com. Again, that's at survivetheimplosion.com. So I'm just going to get right into the topic of today's episode, which is entitled, Don't Take Your Film to a Festival. This was actually a recommendation offered by Jonathan Wolf, the managing director of the AFM. So why did he say this? Well, that's what we're here to do, because we're going to take a deeper look at what event uh, Jonathan Wolf oversees, which is the American Film Market, or the AFM. And this podcast could have easily been entitled AFM, Why You Should or Shouldn't Attend. So what's the AFM? Well, on their press page, or their about page, it's described as the following. The business of independent motion picture production and distribution, a truly collaborative process, reaches its peak every year at the American film market. Over 8,000 industry leaders converge on Santa Monica for eight days of deal-making, screenings, seminars, networking, and parties. Participants come from over 80 countries and include acquisition and development executives, agents, attorneys, directors, distributors, festival directors, financiers, film commissioners, producers, writers, and the world's press, all those who provide services to the motion picture industry. Founded in 1981, the American film market, the AFM, quickly became the premier global marketplace where Hollywood's decision makers and trendsetters all gather under one roof. Unlike a film festival, the AFM is a marketplace where production and distribution deals are closed. In just eight days, more than $1 billion in deals will be sealed on both completed films and those in every stage of development and production, making AFM the must-attend industry event. The AFM transforms Santa Monica. The low Santa Monica Beach Hotel is converted into a busy marketplace, and all 29 screens on the Santa Monica Promenade and the surrounding community become AFM screening rooms. Participants may view more than 700 screenings of approximately 400 films, 29 films every two hours, the majority of them world or U.S. premieres. Titles range from the big-budget blockbusters that will be released by the major studios in the U.S. to lower-budget art and genre films recognized at international film festivals, all destined for theaters and television around the world. With 8,000 attendees, 700 screenings, and the industry's largest conference series, the American film market continues to be the pivotal destination for independent filmmakers and business people from all over the world. (sighs) Yeah, we can take a deep breath right there. It's quite a mouthful, isn't it? And this year, the AFM runs between November 1st and November 8th. So, the AFM is a marketplace. It's not a film festival. But, however, across town, the American Film Institute, AFI, holds their AFI Fest, and this year it's running between November 10th and the 17th. So actually it comes after the market, which doesn't really help anyone as it would probably be better if the AFI Fest you know, ran prior to the AFM. That way if there was a film at the AFI Fest that did well, that performed well, it would have a better uh, a chance of getting attention at the market, don't you think? As you can see, the AFI Fest and the AFM aren't really connected, and there have been some partnerships in the past, but it's not designed like the Cannes Film Festival, which corresponds with the Cannes Films Market. So festivals and market, two different things. Anyway, I'm assuming that most people listening to this podcast are filmmakers, people who can write, shoot, direct, produce, and edit their own films. So is AFM worth attending if you're one of these types of filmmakers? If you're trying to sell your film when you're done, then the AFM sounds like a must event, don't you think? I mean, most filmmakers are hoping that someone buys their film after playing at film festivals, right? Most filmmakers are trying to pay back their parents or at least be offered more work or the dream scenario be offered more money to make the next film. So who makes these types of decisions? Well, probably the people who attend film markets, not film festivals. With film festivals, a filmmaker dreams of being accepted. A filmmaker is hoping that someone picks them and picks their film. You know, it's the whole pick me, pick me, please, please. And that's a lot of hopes and dreams. 
But as Jonathan Wolf explains, there are over 5,000 film festivals across the world, and there are more than 50 film festivals just in LA County alone. Now, Wolf explains that the film festivals are cultural events for the community. A film festival organizer is very much like a museum curator. They are the gatekeepers who decide which piece of art will be exhibited. In contrast, at film markets, any filmmaker can exhibit their film to real buyers. Not to festival-going audiences or judges, but real buyers. You just have to pay the fees. This is what the AFM states on their website about screenings. The AFM is not a festival, so we don't accept film submissions. Exhibiting companies may purchase screening times at AFM screening venues. So that's it. You just pay to be seen. The AFM has connections with 29 screens to exhibit over 400 films, and in 2015, Sundance accepted 184 films. So how much does it cost to screen your film at the AFM? For smaller screens with only HD screening capabilities, uh, it costs anywhere between $290 and $410. And for larger screens with DCP projectors, it will cost you between $1,000 to $1,500 to screen your film. So let that sink in for a moment. You can spend as little as $290 to screen your film at a major film marketplace. Not a festival, a market. Film festival submission fees cost between $50 to $85. So why don't more filmmakers just pay the AFM screening fees? Because there's a catch. Only exhibitors who have paid the exhibition conference pass can pay the additional fee to have their films shown at the market. So if you don't have any representation from one of these exhibitors, then how can you get your film shown at the market? Well, here's how the AFM answers this question. You may contact one of the exhibiting sales companies for representation. The AFM will not recommend any specific exhibitor, nor is it involved in these arrangements. To view a list of sales companies that are IFTA members, see the IFTA member directory. Okay, so you click the link to see who are IFTA members, and IFTA stands for Independent Film and Television Alliance. The AFM is just the event that they put on through this organization called IFTA. Anyway, the AFM offers a long list of companies that are qualified exhibitors slash distributors. Remember how everybody's hoping a distributor will come in and offer you money for your film? Well, the AFM considers them exhibitors because a lot of them are distributors. So the AFM provides this list of all these exhibitors slash distributors and they provide the company website and some of them provide the, you know, the contact email who you need to you know, contact about getting your film screened at like the AFM. If you wanted to be your own exhibitor at the AFM, then you can just apply and pay the fees. It costs $3,500 for the exhibition fee and between $10,000 to $100,000 to secure floor space at the marketplace. Now, of course, $100,000 is a bit much, but $3,500 for the exhibition fee and $10,000 for some booth space? Well, that's a little bit more doable. I mean, that's a crowdfunding campaign. <laughs> there are some local Portland-based production companies that have done just that. They've paid the fees to market their film projects to other buyers. If you don't want to be your own exhibitor, then you can take the time to do the research on each and every company listed who have access to screen movies at the market. Who's to say you couldn't approach these companies, these distributors, these exhibitors, and ask to pay a screening fee plus any administrative fees if they grant you permission to show your film under their exhibitor banner? Most filmmakers don't know about this option, and secondly, most filmmakers just assume you make a film and enter it into a festival to be what? To be discovered. Maybe another reason why most filmmakers don't do this more often is that they know in their hearts they don't have a film that can be sold. Maybe the film doesn't have any named stars in it. Maybe the production quality isn't up to par, especially the sound mix. But if you believe in your film, why not let the marketplace to determine if it's worth buying? Why waste time at festivals? So it all comes down to this comment made by Jonathan Wolf: Don't take your film to a festival. If your film doesn't perform well at major film festivals, then you've lost the marketing edge and perceived value of your film. Many times the film has more value before it's even made or released than when it actually hits the marketplace. Let's think about crowdfunding campaigns. A lot of film projects will raise more money in the potential stage 
as opposed to when the film is actually released and sold to the marketplace, right? By releasing your film to the festival circuit first, you lose the advantage and leverage to sell it later. Or in the least, you lose the leverage to demand a higher paying price, since the buyer can point to the fact that the film didn't premiere at a Sundance type festival and you only won awards at unknown festivals. Oftentimes a distribution company will release a film to the festivals as part of their marketing strategy. So again, think about making your premiere screening at a film market and not a festival. Important note here too, there are only three major film markets in the world, only three. There are over 5,000 film festivals across the world, but only three major film market events. And according to my friend Ben Yenny, producer rep and the author of the book, The Gorilla Rep, American Film Market Distribution Success on No Budget, when he was on my other friend's podcast show, Alex Ferrari's Indie Film Hustle, they explained that the Sundance Film Festival has become sort of a spring break for film executives. So some deals are done, yes, but mostly it's like a Disneyland for adults, where you see some famous actors instead of Mickey Mouse walking around the streets of Park City, Utah. Anyway, the the three major film markets are uh, the European film market held in conjunction with the Berlin Film Festival that takes place in February, the Cannes Film Market, which is held in conjunction with the Cannes Film Festival, which takes place in May, the American Film Market, which has no festival tied to it, takes place in November, And there is a smaller market called the Hong Kong Film Market or Film Mart. It's a smaller event that happens in March. So the question is, should you premiere your film at a festival or at a market? It depends. We need to look at what types of films are screened at the American Film Market. Uh, You know, we should probably start with that first. I mean, you want to know if your film is similar to any kinds of films sold at the market, correct? Before we tackle this question, I want to describe the environment of AFM so you know what it's like to attend the market. In the press release, the AFM describes there will be more than 8,000 industry leaders and over 80 countries represented. What that means in layman terms is that there will be a lot of people there, all with the same incentive to make a deal. Now imagine all these swarthy sort of used car salesmen gathered in Hollywood trying to get attention. No matter who you bump into at the market, there will be an overwhelming perception that everyone thinks they are the king cheese, meaning everyone pretends to have something going on. They might have this deal going on or that deal going on, and it's actually hard to tell sometimes who is full of it and who isn't. There are a lot of wannabes. So it'll be your job to wade through the pretentiousness and the pomp to determine who is the real deal and who isn't. But if you can get through the muck, you can find good people. With the AFM, since it takes place at the Lowe's Hotel just south of the Boardwalk Pier, and you've probably seen the Ferris wheel from various movies and TV shows. Anyway, the Lowe's Hotel is just south of that. The AFM has gotten bigger over the years, and they've expanded to the Marigold Hotel, and they've utilized other hotel conference rooms in the Santa Monica area to hold you know, different conferences like the Pitch Conference which has been moderated by my friend Stephanie Palmer, a former MGM executive and the author of Good in Room. However, this year, the pitch conference is being moderated by Pilar Alessandra from On the Page. Anyway, the main spot is the Lowe's Hotel, which, as described in the About page, is where the AFM takes over this hotel and converts all the what normally would be hotel rooms into, you know, conference rooms or little uh, offices for all the different exhibitors to... um, you know, try to sell and pitch their movie ideas. You can actually just go and hang out in the lobby bar area of the Lowe's Hotel and mingle and socialize if you don't want to pay for an attendee badge. Now, AFM used to open the pool area to anyone, but now you have to have a badge. The cool thing about going to the event every day and just swinging by the lobby area is that you get all the trade publications for free. So Variety and Hollywood Reporter will have a special AFM issues that they just give away for free. According to former film sales agent and founder of Film Specific, Stacey Parks, she recommends stopping by the lobby every day to read through the trades to understand what is being bought and sold at the market. Now, speaking of Stacey, if you really want expert advice on how best to navigate the AFM and all the other film markets across the globe, remember there's only three, you know, three, four of them, that happen every year, then she is your ultimate resource. Not only is Stacy a former sales agent, but she has successfully operated her online business for years and doesn't show any signs of slowing down. She's impressive and is one of the go-to resources for AFM. The other one I would recommend would be Ben Yenny. 
Okay, let's assume that when you're attending AFM, that everyone will pretend to be a mover and shaker. Everyone has a number of films they are pitching, looking for financing, etc. Everyone is really playing up the stereotypical idea of what it's like to be a Hollywood producer or a writer, etc. Basically, everyone is full of crap. <laughs> the real mover and shakers are usually more calm and more jaded. <laughs> Seriously, they, if you look for the ones who just seem more jaded, they're probably more or less like the real, real deal. Now, what's neat about the AFM is that they offer a, you know, half conference pass. So instead of paying money for the full badge for the full, you know, eight days, you can pay uh, just the four day pass, which it really sets up for a filmmaker because the first few days are there for people that already have, you know, past business or have past relationships. You know, they're just sort of uh, working out the deals that may have been going on, you know, prior to the AFM happening. The last four days are much better suited for, you know, writers or producers, you know, pitching new ideas or looking to develop relationships for future projects. So I recommend buying the half day pass or the, I'm sorry, the half conference pass, which is a four day pass. So who becomes successful at these uh, film markets? Well, in an interview with Jonathan Wolf on actually Pilar Alessandro's podcast on the page, uh, Wolf explains that the kinds of people who attend AFM and who become the most successful. So according to Wolf, the three types of producers or that you see at the American film market are usually the creative producer, usually someone who's tied to story development and who works with the writer. And then there's the line producer, someone who understands the logistics of production and budgeting and uh, scheduling and so on. Then there's the sales and business producer. This is the person who understands how to sell and navigate the financing aspects of the film industry. Wolf explains that he sees a lot of people being experts in one of these disciplines and very rare occasions someone might have expertise in two of these areas. But never has he ever seen someone who is an expert in all three disciplines. So the most successful type of producers are, you probably guessed it, the sales and business type producers. The creative producers come and go and the line producers hardly migrate out of just being a hired gun for production. So the big question is, what type of producer are you? Whatever discipline you're not an expert in, then you need to partner with someone who is an expert to build a successful team. And where do you find these people? Well, at the AFM, of course. <laughs> so the goal at this point is to use the AFM to build a team and to make connections for the future. That's if, of course, you want to make the kinds of films that are bought and sold at these markets. Another thing about these three major markets, or say four major markets, is that the same people attend all three. You don't need to travel to Cannes for that market when the same people are coming to the United States for the AFM. Imagine if you had enough money to attend all three film markets every year. You should have plenty of opportunity to meet many real buyers and build those relationships. Now here's the thing, um, advice for anyone who's trying to be successful at networking. Any event you attend, the key to success is follow-up. How many networking events have you attended where you meet people, but you never follow up with them or they never follow up with you? So here's a real story of how important relationships are when trying to get money to make a movie. An executive at a film distribution company had built a long-standing relationship with a Japanese film buying company. So when it came time to meet up at another film market, this executive told the art department to make up a poster with a monster destroying a city and it had to have a helicopter in it. And that's it. So the executive presented the poster to the Japanese buyers and they bought it. The Japanese made a deal to pay like $2 million for the film. The film didn't even exist. A script didn't even exist. But what did exist was a relationship. In fact, over half a billion dollar in deals will be made at AFM for projects that haven't even been made yet. And these are the kinds of deals that are made by long-standing relationships that can make a pitch off a simple poster. So if you're thinking of attending AFM, think of the long-term relationships you need to build. Here's another side note to remember. If you have ever wondered how anyone makes money from making movies, in an interview with James Altucher, the famed producer Brian Grazer, the, the partner to Ron Howard and Imagine Entertainment, well, Grazer explains that a producer makes their money from the budget of the film and some profit sharing if there is any. Actually, everyone's ability to make money from making movies is tied to the budget. These are called the fees. The higher the budget, the higher the fees. Hardly anyone makes money off of profit sharing. The reason uber independent filmmakers struggle to make a living off their films is because the budgets are too low. How do you pay yourself? It's very rare that a filmmaker makes a ton of money from the sale of their film. 
They make their money from the fees based on the budget. So going back to the story of the executive selling a monster film to the Japanese buyers, well, here's how the real money is made. The Japanese offer $2 million for the film. The executive takes the offer letter or a promise note for the $2 million and to get a loan to match that promise note. Now, you think that they would make the film for $2 million, but they don't. The executive will make the film for $500,000 and pocket the $1.5 million as a service fee of what they believe it took to make the deal happen. All the other filmmakers, the director, writer, actors, editors, will be paid a fee based on the $500,000 budget. And none of them will receive profit shares. So if you're wondering, you know, hey, I'm working on this project, the budget is $500,000, there's a good chance that the producer, the right kind of producer, not the creative producer, not the line producer, but a producer who's good at sales and business, is probably making a deal where they might be, you know, charge, you know, paying themselves like a million dollar service fee. That happens. And if Jonathan Wolf is saying that the most successful type of producers that he sees have long term uh, staying power in the in this film industry, this independent film industry, are those types of producers who are good at sales and business. Well, now you know why. <laughs> so if you want to know what kind of deals are going down at AFM, it will be deals like this. If you want to know how to make money in the business, it will be making deals like this. This is independent film. These markets are built around independent film. But not independent film as you might think. It's any film not produced by the major studios. And many times, they aren't the kinds of films you see selling at the prominent film festivals like Sundance. This brings us back to my question. What types of films are screened at the AFM? What kind of films are bought and sold at the AFM? And is your film similar to any of these? Now, we dig deeper into if AFM is right for you. Looking back at the list of exhibitors who attend the AFM and taking the time to research what kinds of films they have released in the past, you can see they are mostly these types of genres. Action-adventure films with stars like Dolph Lundgren. Thrillers with actresses you kind of know and kind of remember who they are. Horror films with no stars, but usually have good-looking young people in them. And family films with dogs or horses and some cute girl who can sing, accompanied by some older actors who were kind of famous, you know, years ago. And that's it. Occasionally, you'll see a drama with Dustin Hoffman and Emma Thompson being sold at the market, or a documentary that has some kind of social issue attached to it. But for the most part, the kinds of films you see being bought and sold are kind of the schlocky genre films. The kinds of films that would have gone straight to the video store back in the day. Now, it's not to knock these types of films, but you rarely find the interesting festival type films at the market. Why? Because they don't sell easily. And the key thing there is selling easily. Having a film that can be sold easily across the world is essential. With only three major film market events every year, a film has to sell in almost every country. That's why the action adventure, thrillers, horror, and family films with dogs and horses do well. Comedies, not so much. Dramas, not so much, unless it has a big star in the film. Now you have to ask yourself, do you have a film that fits into these four genres? Would your film be a natural addition to many of these exhibitors, or should I say distributors, library? If not, then where do you go? Do you hope by having a successful festival run with awards from unknown festivals, will prove to the buyers that it's worth something? Or do you end up releasing it through self-distribution methods? Let's take a look at the flip side of the market. Emily Best, founder and CEO of Seed and Spark, has mentioned that the AFM represents everything that is wrong about the film industry. It's not uncommon to hear from the buyers at the film markets that if your film has female nudity, big explosions, and enough spectacle, you can sell a film fast. If you know who Emily Best is, the idea that a woman has to be sexualized in order to sell a film is sad. There must be another way to sell your film if it doesn't fit into the market mold. This is why Emily started Seed and Spark. The idea is that filmmakers can build an audience and sell to that audience directly. No need to compromise to a middleman who wants to see more boobs, but rather offering a unique vision of a film for a very specific audience. In addition, IndieWire had published an article entitled, Here's What's Wrong with the American Film Market and Hollywood 2. In the article, it states, For the most part, AFM's natural state is to traffic in direct. Posters for genre titles with absurd names and premises predominate. 
Roaming the hallways with no clear agenda felt similar to being stuck in the excessive overload of cheesy pop culture tropes, surrounded by crappy excuses for entertainment to a suffocating degree. One has to wonder who pays for this shit. The answer, it turns out, a lot of people. The article describes all the mucky mucks hanging out along the pool overlooking the Santa Monica Beach. The article grabbed a candid excerpt from an AFM regular who said, It's not a market, it's a vacation that's been billed. Said the longtime AFM attendee, Everything that is being done there can be easily done now over Skype or emails. It's total bullshit. So, there you go. That is the market overview. So where does this leave film festivals? Festivals have become sort of a theatrical run for many filmmakers, building an audience through several screenings at various film festivals. The idea is to build a loyal audience following that sets you up for a successful crowdfunding campaign for your next project. But what many filmmakers have come to learn is that having several successful crowdfunding campaigns doesn't always lead to a sustainable filmmaking career where you can make a decent wage. Only a few filmmakers have cracked the code, and they do so under the radar. It's not part of the mainstream press. So for those filmmakers who are struggling to make a decent wage, they will sometimes reside trying to make a film for a distribution company who will actually pay them, you know, some money. And then what kind of films get made? That's right, the same four genres. Action adventure, thrillers, horrors, and family films with dogs and horses and singing girls. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of films are you making? Are they in alignment with the marketplace? And should I even bother with film festivals if the end result is to go to the market anyway? But if you know the type of films you want to make and you realize they don't fit into the marketplace, then you need to find other business models to succeed and thrive. What's exciting is that there are more and more possibilities of carving out a filmmaking career that don't follow any traditional path. The film markets may not be for everyone. You just have to make that decision for yourself. So what are the alternate ways of selling your film when you're finished? Well, you're in luck because I encourage you to check out the book that I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this podcast called How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion While Doing It. It explores in depth different ways of selling your film online. Like when you're finished with, you know, if you don't have a distribution deal, if you know, you don't even have an audience, like how does it all fit in that where you can start selling your film on these different platforms? And it's not just about like, oh, just upload it to Amazon or Vimeo and then start selling it. It's not that, that kind of a book. It actually goes into more depth about what you're really selling. Again, you can find out more information about this book if you go to survivetheimplosion.com. And as I mentioned, the, the, you know, the top of the podcast, you can get the audiobook for free when you sign up with Audible for the first 30 days. And again, that's at survivetheimplosion.com. So that wraps up this unique uh, podcast episode because normally I have guests on and we have a discussion about, you know, a lot of Q&A and we try to explore a different topic from, you know, their standpoint. But I really wanted to explore the American film market in depth because it actually it's actually going on right now. But I wanted to unveil, like, just because you hear, like, well, you need to make a film like this in, in order to get, you know, someone to buy it, you know, to get buyers to be interested, to get a distribution deal, that kind of stuff. I want you to realize that it's not for everyone. It's not for every film. And if your film doesn't fit into the film market mold, then think about other ways of going about your filmmaking career. Seed and Spark is a community, uh, you know, a service that offers an opportunity to really build a strong connection um, relationship with your audience or to build an audience so that you can make films down the line. And then as well, you know, I encourage you to check out the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion while doing it, because it does open up different possibilities for your filmmaking future. That's all I got for you today. If you really enjoy this podcast, you know, I encourage you to go to filmtrooper.com forward slash iTunes to leave a ratings and review for me over on iTunes. It's, you know, very much appreciated and it actually helps get the podcast out there. It helps with the rankings. It helps, you know, get it, you know, higher on the charts so people can, other filmmakers can discover it or just tell one of your filmmaking friends, you know, about the, the podcast. It's uh, very helpful. Until then, I will see you next time. Film Trooper, filmmaking freedom for the independent.